over the phone in the middle of the night. No, not that, not that again. Not him, not that voice, not those words. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Ring of Evil. This is Lorraine Rayburn. Who's this? Vince? Vince who? What do you mean, just Vince? I can't think of any Vince I know. Oh, I'm frightfully sorry. I just can't place you. I've been running all over town the last month showing my own spring designs. But that's the fashion business at showing time. I hope you don't feel insulted, Vince. It was nearly one when I got in and I passed out from utter fatigue. Hmm? Well, it's two o'clock. Of course I'm lying in bed. What? What do you mean, what I'm wearing? That's none of your business. I don't care how you like to think of me. Well, I don't think it's a bit funny. Never in my life have I... Now stop it. Are you drunk or something? I don't know who you are, what you are. Stop it. Stop it. Stop saying that disgusting word. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Oh. Oh. What happened? Oh, Anne, I've never... Never? Never what? No. I, I heard you shouting. It's somebody. It was the phone. Oh, I thought somebody got in or, or a nightmare. It was the phone. I was asleep. And I, well, who was uh, it? I don't know. A man, he called himself Vince, but I don't know anybody named Vince. Oh, you mean just a wrong number? No, and he asked for me. In the most awful language. I'm not exactly a prude, and you hear some pretty rough stuff around the workshop at times, but never in my life. <laughs> the kind of thing you see scrawled on subway walls. Oh, 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 I feel like things are crawling all over me. And and you don't know who it was? I have the slightest idea. Couldn't recognize the voice or the accent or anything. He wouldn't tell me his last name. He said I didn't know. It's possible. You meet hundreds of people, and some of them are kooks and creeps, but whoever he is, you're not responsible, Lorraine. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but maybe I am. Maybe I give men the wrong impression that I'd... Welcome such a call. Oh, Lorraine, that's idiotic. Maybe, but I don't know what to think or what to do. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I can't change my telephone number in the middle of the season. I'd be dead. And I'm so tired I could scream. Oh, Lorraine, calm down. Get to sleep. When Peter picks me up tomorrow night, you discuss it with him. Oh, I, I couldn't. Not Peter. He's too nice a guy. Oh, Anne, you don't know how lucky you are to be engaged to a man like Peter. I sure miss you when you get married. <laughs> it's not luck. I worked at it. You could do as well. But you want your career, your freedom to circulate. All I want is Peter. You talk to him. He'll help you. Thanks, dear. I will. I, I feel better, much better. I think I can sleep now. I hope. <laughs> No, don't answer. No. Uh, hello? Yes. Yes, Vince. I hung up because I couldn't stand it. Please let me sleep tonight. I need my sleep desperately. <laughs> That's terrible, Lorraine. 
and told me a little bit about it at lunch, but I didn't realize it was as repulsive as all that. Oh, Peter, you wouldn't have any idea. Oh, I've heard of things like that. These obscene phone calls, but... Peter, what do you think I can do about it? Well, now, Lorraine, I, I don't want you to be offended, but are you sure that this whole thing happened? Sure? Well, of course I'm sure. Peter, dear, I heard her shouting. Well, what I'm getting at is, couldn't it have been a nightmare? No, Peter, I saw Lorraine. And I'll swear she was awake. Yes, I was, Peter. And I was for the second call. And most of the rest of the night. I, I'm just exploring the possibilities. Now, this fellow Vince, uh, would you say he was drunk? Well, he didn't sound drunk. His speech wasn't slurred. It, it was clear. Only too clear. I didn't miss a word. I see. A and you've never met anyone by that name? Well, maybe I have, but I can't remember. Well, maybe he got the number from the phone book. Well, you know our number here is unlisted. Well, then you must have given it to him. I guess I must, unless he copied it some some office record somewhere. Oh, Peter, I'm so upset. I thought maybe I ought to call the police. Oh, I think you're making a little too much of this. But what do you advise, Peter? I told Lorraine I, I was sure you'd have some suggestion or some help. <laughs> Believe me, I need both. Well, Lorraine, I, I, I would try to ignore the whole thing. It may never happen again. And if it does, this... This Vince character will soon understand that you're too nice a girl to play his game. Peter's sweet optimism was very contagious, but my optimism lasted only until 12.30 that night, when the telephone bell once more shattered the stillness of the night. This time I was prepared, I thought. I tried to find out where the call was coming from. It was useless. I knew I couldn't hang up on him until he'd poured out the sewage of his mind. There was no escape. So it continued. Soon he began to call during the day, too. He seemed to know when I might be home. And even when several days went by, there was no relief. Whether I wanted to or not, I thought of him constantly with fear and disgust. My life was distorted. My career was suffering. I had to do something. Mr. LaManna, I've decided I can't take it any longer. That's why I've come to the telephone company. Well, now I understand, Miss Rayburn, but you must realize it's a very difficult problem. Well, surely you can do something to stop it. Miss Rayburn, we handle 25 million calls a day. 25 million, mind you. Now, our company can't be responsible for the content of these calls. Well, I'm not interested in the 25 million calls. What can you do for me? Well, of course, we can change your number or we can keep it unlisted, but... Unfortunately, this would cost you many valuable contacts, both business and social contacts. I don't want to change my number. I shouldn't have to. Well, in your case, I can't even advise it. We have found out that anybody who really wants the number can get it. Uh, not from us, mind you, but from personnel records and so on and so forth. Mr. LaManna, I can't go on living like this. I'll go stark raving mad. Can't you investigate and trace calls? Well, we have no power. This man is violating the criminal code. Now, I suggest you go to the police. The police? Well, it's the only way. Now, we cooperate with them all that we can. We can do nothing without them. Not at all, Mr. Rayburn. It's my job, and I'll do everything I can. But I can do nothing without you. I'd be a pretty poor policeman if I told you otherwise, miss. Detective Simmons, what can I do? I've tried every way to get him to reveal his address, his telephone number, his last name. He's driven me to distraction. You forgive me for saying so. There's one thing any woman can do, talk. It takes lots of time to trace a call, even if it comes through just one exchange. It's bad enough to listen, but talk... You'll have to, miss. I'm sorry. Each contact point has to be checked by the telephone company while the call is still in progress. But I've got nothing to say to him. Well, you'll have to hold him on the line, sweet talk him, make old Vince think he's getting somewhere with the object of his peculiar affection. Oh, no. Really, no. Oh, yes. Now, I don't say it's either easy or pleasant, but you've got to get close to a snake before you can kill it. Think it over, Mr. Rayburn. Yes. Yes, Vince. I'm here. No, I, I've been awake. I've been reading. Don't you understand, Vince? I couldn't sleep. 
I was waiting for your call. I missed you. Of course I did. I can't help it. Your voice is so exciting. It just gives me chills. No, really, it, it does. It's so exciting. <laughs> I was too impulsive when I decided to play along with Vince and his disgusting calls. But I had to do something. I found myself in a nightmare that terrified me. Could this be me? Could this be my life I was living? The only thing that kept me going was Detective Simmons and the loyal friendship of Ann Howard and Peter Wardell. At least I could talk to them, and I poured out all my worries and troubles. Lorraine, we'll just have to change our number. Yeah, why don't you? Well, because I promised Detective Simmons I'd see this through, and I'm going to, even if it kills me. Which it may, very well, if you're not sensible. You're not looking well, Lorraine. Oh, I'm just tired. He called twice last night? Once at 1.15 and then 4.30. I kept him talking for eight minutes the first time and 11 minutes the next, and neither were long enough to trace. I still think Peter ought to stay here in our apartment on the couch tonight. If this Vince... Heard a man's voice, it, it would scare him good and plenty. Yes, but I don't want to scare him. It's too late for that. And besides, Peter's done enough. Lorraine, believe me, I'd be glad to. Oh, Peter, you're sweet, but you stayed over twice and lost a lot of sleep for nothing. Just because he didn't call those two nights doesn't mean that he won't call tonight. Oh, well, Peter's done enough. He'd be glad to stay, wouldn't you, darling? Of course I would. Lorraine, Ann and I have talked it over, and we feel we can't get married until these calls are stopped once and for all. I wouldn't dream of leaving you alone in this apartment, as long as that man is loose. You two are wonderful. Well, all right, let's try again tonight, Peter. Good. If I could only rid you of this Vince, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Peter stayed that night, and reassured by his presence, I slept a blessed sleep. But the telephone didn't ring all night, so nothing was accomplished. Nothing seems to work, Detective Simmons. I can't keep this up. I just can't. Isn't there some other way? Why should we be so helpless? Miss Rayburn, everybody's doing all they can, but the calls don't seem to come from the same exchange. The other night, the telephone company traced through five digits. Another few minutes, they might have had the whole number and we could have moved in. But you know, it takes time. The calls just aren't long enough. I try to extend them. Heaven knows I try, but there's just so much I can stand. I listen and talk and listen, and then all of a sudden I feel sick to my stomach. I panic. I admit it. And I close the conversation as fast as I can. You see, I was brought up in a small town, so I suppose this sounds foolish to you. Oh, not a bit, Miss Rayburn. I was brought up in the streets of New York, but some of these guys I feel like handling with tweezers. So I have nothing but admiration for you, miss. You've got guts, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, thank you, but I wish it did me some good. Maybe it will, but that depends on how much more you can do. Not much more. I'm almost at the end of my rope. Miss Rayburn, listen to me. If you're game, we'll try a long shot. Game for what? I want you to make a date, Vince. Oh, I couldn't. Take your friends with you to be witnesses. I'll be there, and if Vince shows, I'll pick him up. I... I, I don't know. You'll never be bothered again, miss. Think of that. I am thinking of it. Maybe... Maybe I'll try. Yes, Vince. I'm listening. Well, sure, honey. I was waiting for your call. That voice of yours is so thrilling. You must be a fascinating guy to be with. No, no, Vince, I'm not kidding you. It's, it's great talking to you, but, you know, it's been a long time since you first called, and I'm bored with just talk. You know what I mean? Yes, I want to meet you, Vince. I, I've got to meet you in the worst way. I do nothing but think of you all day and all night. Oh, please, Vince, let's get together. Well, what's there to think about? Not maybe. Say yes. How about tomorrow? At 8 o'clock in the evening. You know the Hotel Phyllis? Yes. Yes, that's it. 45th Street, just east of Broadway, in the lobby. 
Well, just wear a red handkerchief in your breast pocket. Oh, don't worry. I'll be there. I'll be there. Hello? This is Miss Rayburn. I want to leave a message for Detective Simmons. Now, Miss Howard. Yes, Detective Simmons. You sit over in the corner where you can see Miss Rayburn. Read your book, but keep a sharp eye for anyone who approaches her. I'll go there. Right casual, now. casual. Keep it casual. Mr. Mordell? Yes, sir. Lean against the pillar like you were waiting for a date. Whatever you say. Don't glance at Miss Howard or Miss Rayburn. I get it. Uh, where will you be? I'm going to slip on a porter's jacket. Look like I'm cleaning the lobby. I guess that'll make me entirely inconspicuous. Think you're going to nab him tonight? Your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Wardell. Through the corner of my eye, I saw Anne and Peter take their places. A moment later, Detective Simmons started mopping the grimy marble floor. I knew their eyes were on me and their hearts were with me. Or I would have run away. As it was, I waited with my heart pounding, watching the approach of each strange man, looking for the red handkerchief, which meant that this was the malignant spirit who had appropriated my life, scanning each masculine face for the shadow of evil. Time passed slowly like it had in the many nightmares I had known since that first telephone call. I waited. I waited. He never showed up. Peter took Anne and me home. I excused myself and went to bed, but not to sleep, not for a long time, not until I heard the door slam shut as Peter took his leave of Anne. That was the last thing I remembered until... Hello? Hello? Oh, it's... It's you, Vince. What happened to you tonight? Why did you stand me up? Well, of course you stood me up, and I know why. Sure, I'll tell you, Vince. You're chicken. Oh, yes, you are. You're not man enough. All you can do is talk, talk, talk on the telephone. You're afraid of me. That's why you didn't come to the Hotel Phyllis tonight. What? What do you mean you were there? Where? You were there watching me? And you thought I was trying to trap you? Well, Vince, how was I going to trap you? Anne and Peter? And that detective? What detective? Simmons? You know his name. I see. And you know Anne and Peter. Ah! <gasps> oh, dear God. Peter! Nobody else fits. Peter, listen to me. No one else knows those three names. That's how I know. The voice doesn't fool me any longer. Oh, Peter, Peter, what am I going to tell Anne? No wonder I never heard from Vince the night you stayed here. Oh, Peter, 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 listen to me. You need help. You're sick, sicker than anyone I've ever known. And unless you get help, I'm going to have to tell Anne the whole story. As sure as God is in his heaven, I'll see that she doesn't marry you, Peter. It's no use telling me that you love her very much. You have to face the fact that you... Peter! 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 They found his body the next morning. Torn. Torn, as it were, between the two worlds in which he lived. Anne kept him in her memory with infinite love. She never understood his sudden death. And I never told her. Theater 5 has presented Ring of Evil, written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Vicki Bola, Roger DeCoven, Ann Costello, Elliot Reed, and Hal Hackett. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. 
Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.